Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Friday, October 2nd. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi, and we begin with breaking developments. President Trump hospitalized after testing positive for COVID-19. It's being called a precautionary move, but one that is shaking the White House to the core. The First Lady also positive, many tonight wondering who else might be. And we have team coverage, KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman on the local reaction. But first, Mary Maloney on the president's condition and questions being raised. The president and first lady in quarantine at the White House after contracting the coronavirus. He's had mild symptoms, but he is hard at work. Um, we're having to slow him down a little bit. President Trump, who is in a high risk category for serious complications, insisted in a tweet we will get through this together. I'm optimistic that uh, he'll have a very quick and speedy recovery. Hours before he was diagnosed, the president downplayed the COVID-19 pandemic still ravaging the country. I just want to say that the end of the pandemic is in sight. Thursday, after his aide, Hope Hicks, tested positive for COVID-19, the president attended a private fundraiser in New Jersey. Wednesday, he held a Minnesota rally with minimal masks and little social distancing. We will make America safe again. Tuesday, the president shared the debate stage with Democratic nominee Joe Biden. I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. Biden and his wife tested negative, as did his running mate, Senator Kamala Harris, and Vice President Mike Pence and the Second Lady. But the president is now a patient and will temporarily withdraw from the campaign trail all because of the coronavirus pandemic. Sad as the diagnosis is that the president and first lady have, maybe it is the, trend, the pivotal moment to take us to a different place as we fight this vicious virus. Mary Maloney, KPBS News. President Trump's White House doctor says the president received an experimental antibody cocktail to treat the virus. That's according to this letter addressed to the White House press secretary. The experimental treatment is from Regeneron, which is in phase three trials. The doctor also said the president remains fatigued, but in good spirits. Meanwhile, here in San Diego, elected leaders on both sides of the aisle are also reacting to the news. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman has a roundup. If I could speak to the president, I would love to tell him that I appreciate the hard work he does and I wish him well and I pray that he gets healthy soon. El Cajon Mayor Bill Wells is one of the many local officials hoping the president makes a quick recovery. This will be a, an opportunity for people to see somebody that they really know about go through the process. Uh, he is an older man and he has a couple of comorbidities, so um, there's no guarantee that he'll be okay, but he, he also has uh, great medical care and I think that uh, with any luck, he'll be back and around pretty quickly. Wells was invited to the White House last year and met briefly with the president. San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner has also met with President Trump, saying on Twitter today he's praying for the first family and wishing them well. Also, that this is a reminder for all of us to take the virus seriously. Former Congressman Daryl Issa, who is now running in the 50th Congressional District, said on Twitter he is wishing the president a safe and speedy recovery. His Democratic opponent, Amar Kampanajar, also wishing the president and his family a safe recovery and asking people not to politicize this diagnosis. Diagnosis. People are a little shocked and dismayed by the horrible things that people are saying on Twitter about hoping he dies, and that's this is not the time for that. We've got we've got to get away from this divisive hatred of each other. From San Diego County's congressional delegation, Congressman Scott Peters says he's wishing a full recovery for the president and first lady. Juan Vargas also doing the same, saying he's continuing to pray for our country during these difficult times. Susan Davis wishing a quick recovery and hoping this helps the president gain empathy for Americans suffering because of the virus. Mike Levin also hoping the president and first lady make a full and fast recovery. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. 
And now for an update on the coronavirus in San Diego County. Today, two more deaths from the virus were reported and 306 new cases were confirmed. Two new community outbreaks were confirmed in a hair salon and a hotel, bringing the total in the past seven days to 28. San Diego County is currently in Tier 2, or the Red Tier. That's based on the state calculated case rate, which is evaluated every Tuesday. Just two days after reopening, a staffer at West Hills High in Santee has tested positive for the coronavirus. On Tuesday, the Grossmont Union High School District welcomed a limited number of students back to campuses. A spokesperson said 23 students at West Hills will now suspend in-person learning as part of the public health guidelines. They say there is no reason to close the school and that it has been cleaned and deemed safe. 32,000 airline employees face furloughs after lawmakers and the White House failed to agree on a pandemic relief package. KPBS reporter Jacob Ayer says the cuts to the airline industry hurt San Diego tourism and the local economy. The proposed relief package included $20 billion in federal aid for airlines, but at the moment, two major U.S. carriers are planning furloughs. They would affect 19,000 workers at American Airlines and about 13,000 at United Airlines. But both companies vowed to reverse the job cuts if the government agrees to provide additional aid in the next few days. Still, airport traffic is way down. Most notably, you know, in, in April, which was probably the height of the pandemic, we were down um, about 95 percent over last year. So that means 95 percent you know, less people were coming through the airport. Um, in September, we ended at uh, 69 uh, percent down over the previous year. And in San Diego, nationwide airline reductions and layoffs have been affecting the local economy. I will tell you that the decrease in flight has, uh, flights have greatly impacted um, us as a destination for, for leisure travel and business travel. This month, American Airlines cut 83,000 flights from its October schedule. That represents a 55% decrease in flights from last October. And the airline only represents a fraction of all U.S. travel. So there were some routes cut, most notably our international destinations because of the government um, restrictions that are in place. At stake are the jobs of pilots, flight attendants, baggage handlers, counter agents, and other airline and airport personnel. And the economic impacts to tourism could be felt for years. 2023 and 2024 are our expected years of recovery, right? And when I say recovery is getting back to what we were making prior to COVID without any inflation. Two other major U.S. airlines, Delta and Southwest, have teamed up with private capital markets to help them avoid layoffs for the time being. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. The two candidates for San Diego mayor are taking shots at each other over short-term rentals. This comes after our partners at iNewsource reported a dramatic spike in police activity at a downtown high-rise used to host pandemic parties. Assemblyman Todd Gloria vowed to take action within his first 100 days if elected and said his opponent, Councilwoman Barbara Bree, would rather do nothing. Bree responded saying Gloria has blocked regulations in the past and his campaign is supported by vacation rental companies. For more on this story, go to inewsource.org. A reminder, mail-in ballots start going out to all registered San Diego County voters on Monday. That's also when our KPBS Voter Guide will go live on kpbs.org. You'll be able to check your registration, find out where and how you can vote, and research your ballot specific to your address. For weeks, California has been ravaged by wildfires with nearly 4 million acres burned this year. And as the worst fire season on record wears on, relief is not yet in sight. Connor Powell has the latest from Napa County. Pull up, pull up. For all of the firefighters working together to try to control the glass fire in Sonoma and Napa counties, two bigger forces are working against them. Forecasted high heat and strong winds. It's absolutely devastating the, the, and heartbreaking, the destruction that I have seen, the people that I know that have lost their homes and their livelihoods. The glass fire is one of two major wildfires still out of control in Northern California. The fire is 60,148 acres. Uh, we remain at 6% containment. When combined with the Zog fire in Shasta County, 
More than 100,000 acres are burned, and the fires continue. Hundreds of buildings are destroyed, hitting wine country especially hard, while the fight to save homes and businesses continue. It, uh, it takes a lot out of you. Um, so I hate to see it happen, but then, you know, that's, that's the way this is right now. One person says it's like we can't run away. Cal Fire says there have been more than 8,100 wildfires, about 100,000 people evacuated, and at least 30 have died since the beginning of the year. All this devastation makes even small winds mean more, like this mountain lion cub rescued from the flames. Yet as California's governor saw Thursday surveying the damage, so much more is lost. It's been a remarkable year, close just shy of 4 million acres now burned year to date. In Napa County, California, Connor Powell. There won't be any trains running between Oceanside and San Diego this weekend. Crews will be working on stabilizing the bluffs below the tracks in Del Mar. KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne has a look at the progress. So we, we are pleased to be working on this because this is part of the second busiest rail corridor in the nation, supporting more than a billion dollars in goods movement per year. I don't know. So far, three phases of the Del Mar Bluff stabilization project have been completed. The goal is to ensure safe and efficient travel on the coastal rail corridor. Today, construction crews approach the completion of the fourth phase, which includes seawall replacements, drainage improvements, and additional piles to support the railroad tracks. Yes, this is a very important safety consideration for people and goods. Erosion and the threat of rising sea levels have stressed the immediate need to complete the stabilization efforts and to identify a long-term solution for the bluff segment of the corridor. So we're going to continue to do the inspections. We're going to continue to engage with our engineers because, again, Mother Nature is in charge. So whatever we design today may require additional reinforcement over time. So we're going to keep attuned to that and then continue to look forward to the future to make sure that we identify that right project to support permanent relocation of the tracks. In the meantime, phase five of stabilization and reinforcement is anticipated to begin next summer. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. The coronavirus case rate measures how many new daily positive tests are happening out of every 100,000 San Diegans. But it also decides if restrictions on businesses or tightened or loosened, are tightened or loosened. In a series of stories, KPBS health reporter Taryn Mento traces back where that data comes from. And here comes the President of the United States. President John F. Kennedy visited San Diego just five months before his 1963 assassination. He's waving to all of the people along, waving to our camera right now. A photograph captures his motorcade passing by the 24-hour Rudford's restaurant. The community staple has welcomed diners at all hours since that day, but that streak ended in March. Governor Gavin Newsom closed all on-site dining to curb the spread of coronavirus. We let go of 40 people. That was hard to do. Rudford's owner, Jeff Kasha, was forced to only offer takeout. Kasha has since been stuck in a cycle of reopenings and threatened closings based on the up and down of local coronavirus cases. We put in dividers, we have masks, we have gloves, everything sanitized. Across California, activities like dining in a restaurant or practicing your faith are controlled by coronavirus numbers. KPBS examined the data that's driving decisions in San Diego and found it's riddled with complexities and caveats. I wouldn't say I'm confident down to the last decimal point. Dr. Bill Schaffner is the medical director of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. He says these systems can be imperfect. But pretty close and close enough to make reasonable decisions and to assess trends over time. In a series of stories, KPBS is exploring this data-driven system in San Diego to uncover the challenges and how they're overcome. And that system sort of begins with snot. You're going to go about to the mid-level of your nose. Nurse Darcy LeRae walks me through how to shove a swab up my nostril. You're going to rotate it several times around the wall of your nose. Lab machines will examine the secretion for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's what causes COVID-19. You might cough or sneeze. My results were negative, but thousands of snot-covered swabs from the noses of San Diegans are transported daily to labs. At Helix Lab in La Jolla, the hours-long process 
process to get test results begins with a robot named Boots. Boaties, Boaties. Actually, he thinks he's Boaties, that double O gives him problems. But the results he and his machine friends uncover are relayed back to local and state decision makers through a complex and sometimes overlapping reporting network. And it gets a bit wonky, so stick with me. Helix only handles local swabs collected at county testing sites. So Vice President Mark Laurent says they share results with San Diego officials twice. One way is we actually send it back to uh, the operations team that's going to uh, contact the patient. And then to the team that tracks the data that controls reopenings that's sent by fax. It's ancient, but it's also one of the most uh, safe way to pass uh, HIPAA information along. And they send it to a state team in Sacramento. So labs report both to the state and to the county. But some commercial labs report only to the state, which automatically passes San Diego results on to the county. And labs report to the health care providers that sent them the tests so they can tell patients. Providers also report confirmed cases to the county. The county's public health team wouldn't agree to an interview, but said in an email that staff checks daily results against its database. If they find a new result is actually a duplicate, it's attached to the existing record. But the county says some may slip through. Still, San Diego and Sacramento don't always agree on the numbers that may trigger closings. Their calculations didn't match for a bit. Thousands of results were lost in a statewide glitch. And most recently, elected county officials, including Supervisor Greg Cox, wanted the state to ignore positives among San Diego State University students. Seriously consider discounting or, or not including the, the approximately 700 cases that we have right now from uh, SDSU uh, students. The governor disagreed. So the answer is no. That looming closure was avoided because the case rate, even with SDSU positives, was below a state threshold. But the back and forth has left Rudford's owner, Kasha, on edge. We ran out of PPP money. We were into our savings. We've overspent. He worries he can't survive another closure, but the case rate is only announced on Tuesdays, so businesses wait every week to learn if the data is going in the wrong direction. And this past week, San Diego again narrowly avoided a case rate the governor considers too high. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. KPBS will continue to report stories on the region's triggers as part of its ongoing series. You can look at all 13 data points using the KPBS Trigger Tracker at kpbs.org. Today, San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner officially reopened the city's playgrounds after they'd been closed more than six months. The change came after KPBS found the state had no plans for reopening playgrounds. State representatives then pushed the governor for a reopening strategy. Faulkner also laid out new rules that include requirements for masks and hand washing. As we open our playgrounds, remind folks, remind parents, remind kids, please follow all of the common sense precautions because we want to keep these playgrounds open. And I will tell you when it comes to using our outdoor spaces, our parks, it's really defined who we are as San Diegans. New signs are also up to give maximum capacities for each structure. Faulkner and one lucky child got to do what many kids have dreamed about since March. Tear down the orange fencing around the playground and use the swings. Happy Friday, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to KPBS News. I'm Aki Weathers, Marvin Gomez. As we transition into the weekend, finally starting to see that gradual cooling of temperatures across our area. We have that onshore flow coming back as well, and that will bring us that morning fog and those low clouds as well. The weather will continue to stay dry, not only for San Diego County, but for most of the southwest as we go through the weekend and even into the start of the upcoming week. The heat again has been a topic of conversation across our area. Notice we still have an excessive heat warning in effect until 8 o'clock our time. Now, as we take a quick look at the satellite and radar in the last couple of hours, not a whole lot of action across California. We're not even seeing clouds off across the eastern side of the Pacific either. That area of high pressure will continue across the southwest. Now, here's a quick look at tonight. 
Looking at Escondido, near 60 degrees at your low temperature. Ramona cooling down to 54 degrees. Chula Vista, 64. That area of high pressure that we have in the southwest will be drifting south. And again, keep in mind that onshore flow will be coming back. And it's not going to be so hot as we go through the weekend. Here's a quick look at our Saturday, 94 degrees over in Escondido. Oceanside, 84 degrees for your afternoon. Mostly sunny conditions. The heat will continue across the interior portions of the southwest for Sunday. But along the California coastline, again, that onshore flow will be bringing us much cooler temperatures. Here's a quick look at your extended forecast along the coast. We're going to be seeing those temperatures in the mid to low 80s for the next couple of days. Some more opportunities for clouds as we transition into Monday along the coast and in inland areas as well. We're getting finally into the upper 80s into Wednesday of next week. And across some of the higher terrain, mid 70s and even low 70s into the middle of the upcoming work week. And here's a quick look at the desert forecast. Triple digits will continue for you out there. Mostly sunny conditions for the next couple of days. For KPBS News, I'm Marvin Gomez. Back to you. For the first time since the pandemic started, Amazon is sharing how many of its frontline employees have contracted the coronavirus. The company says 20,000 employees at both Am Amazon and Whole Foods have tested positive or been presumed positive since March 1st. Amazon has 1.3 million employees and says its positivity rate is lower than case rates within the general public. The final jobs report before the presidential election shows 661,000 jobs were added in September. The unemployment rate also dipped below 8 percent for the first time since March. It's the fifth month in a row of job additions, though fewer than previous months. The September reading signals a slowdown in the economic recovery from the pandemic. Still, more layoffs in tourism industries were reported this week. SDSU's Miro Kopik has more in the Friday Business Report. Disney yesterday announced 28,000 layoffs across their theme parks around the country. Their profits were down through the first six months of the year, almost 75% almost exclusively driven by theme parks. On the airline side, American Airlines and, and United yesterday announced a collective 35,000 layoffs. And, and this is because on Wednesday, September the 30th, the last amount of government support stopped that was part of the CARES Act. American Airlines and United both said if there is a stimulus bill passed over the next few days and signed by the president, that they would rescind these, uh, these layoffs and, and the furloughs. But progress on Capitol Hill over the last couple of days has not been very, has not been very solid. Additionally, the airline industry through in the United States through uh, the end of the year is expected to lose nearly $30 billion, which is which is why that they're saying, you know, if I have to keep, we'd like to keep employees, but it's going to be very difficult to do so under the current circumstances. Right now, the Padres are playing a winner-take-all game at Petco Park after a thrilling comeback kept their playoff hopes alive. For much of last night's wild card game against the St. Louis Cardinals, the Friars were behind, but that all changed in the sixth with a three-run homer from Fernando Tatis Jr. The Padres went on to win 11-9. Game three is underway right now. It's another must-win to continue the postseason, and we say go Padres. Brandon Cronenberg is the son of Canadian director David Cronenberg, the man who gave us such films as Videodrome and The Fly Remake. KPBS film critic Beth Accomando says you can see the family resemblance in Brandon's sophomore feature, Possessor, which opens today at the South Bay Drive-In. <laughs> Do you not agree that the mania surrounding celebrity is reaching an unhealthy level? No, I don't. With his first feature, Antiviral, Brandon Cronenberg announced himself as a bold new talent. And his second feature, Possessor, doesn't disappoint. Like his father, David Cronenberg, Brandon reveals a penchant for body horror, cerebral cinema, and unnerving his audience. But despite the shared DNA, Brandon displays a unique cinematic personality. Interface is active and we're at full power. Possessor doesn't waste time explaining the creepy science fiction that sets the plot in motion. We're just presented with Tasia Voss, a woman who operates as an assassin by taking over the mind and body of an unwilling surrogate. Oh, meow. 
The film taps into current anxiety about privacy issues and evil corporations, but more disturbingly, it digs into the human psyche to explore darker questions about identity. Is Voss losing her identity in a battle with her latest surrogate? What are you doing? I can't pull the trigger. Or does her job simply allow her to unleash suppressed violence? Possessor is disturbing and relentless, but in a brilliant and riveting way. Experience it if you dare. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. A recap of our top story. President Trump is hospitalized in D.C. for COVID-19. Marine One airlifting Mr. Trump to Walter Reed Hospital as, quote, a precaution. Tonight, the president sent out this video tweet. I want to thank everybody for the tremendous support. I'm going to Walter Reed Hospital. I think I'm doing very well, but we're going to make sure that things work out. The First Lady is doing very well. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I will never forget it. Thank you. The president is expected to stay there for a few days. His doctors say he has a low-grade fever and received an experimental coronavirus treatment. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following, by viewers like you. Thank you.